Hey gang, welcome to part two of your five themes of geography video lecture. In part one, we took a look at location, talking about absolute and relative location. We took a look at place, talking about physical or natural characteristics and human characteristics. And then we talked about region, how we can kind of chunk the world based on common characteristics. This video is going to cover our final two of the five themes. So let's dive in. Here we go. Um, our next theme is movement. The question that goes along with movement is how do people, stuff, and ideas get to and from a location? Seems simple. But notice that with this one, um, movement, it's it's broken down into, again, a kind of three um, – three categories there. Sorry about that as I just kind of fumble with some of those things. Um, but we're talking about um, people, stuff, and ideas. People, stuff, and ideas and how they move to and from. So let's talk about people. That's you and I, human beings. Um, when we talk about movement of people, we can talk about migration. Um, and so that's people moving from one part of the world to another. You could be migrating from, say, the North Shore or the Iron Range of Minnesota to uh, the Twin Cities. That could be considered migration. You could move from country to country, right? You could have people who are migrating from the United States to Brazil, for example, talking about just waves of migration. Um, sometimes migration, um, folks are drawn to a certain area because they have opportunities there, and other times they're kind of pushed to a certain area because they're fleeing something like war or conflict uh, or something to that effect. So we talk about migration. Are there big waves of people to a location or from a location? Migration is constantly happening around the world, uh, both because of those pull factors, people being drawn, and push factors, people being pushed. So migration. Um, that's one form of movement, but then there's also modes of transportation. Um, and you want to think about uh, how do people get around a certain area? So if you think about our community in STMA, most folks get around on car uh, or foot or bike, something like that. But if you were to go down into the Twin Cities, those modes of transportation change pretty dramatically. Not only do you have car and foot, but you've got a lot of folks um, taking light rail, taking bus, and then zipping around on those little scooters um, that we see all over the city. So those are different types of modes of transportation. And then you could compare that to another city like New York, where you're going to toss in taxi cabs and subway systems, right? So those are all different modes of transportation. So people can refer to both how uh, different waves of people moving to and from a place, but also how people move to and from a place. We also have stuff, talking about movement of stuff all around the world. You could talk about how it's transported um, and how things get from point A to point B, like on a container ship or a train or something like that, uh, or trucks, right? Like if you think about the city of Duluth, Duluth and Superior, um, you see it's got a big shipping port where there's lots of big ships that come in and out of the harbor. So that's how the stuff is moved. But you also, more typically when you talk about movement of stuff, more typically you're going to be talking about the resources and products that are moving to and from a place, right? So again, let's talk about the North Shore of Minnesota. What is the stuff that's moving in and out? Typically, it's iron ore moving in and out from the iron range. Um, and so when you're looking at a place and you're talking about movement of stuff, you typically look for imports. What does that country or place bring into their country from somewhere else and then exports what do they sell to the world what do they give to the world um, and movement of stuff like you can't throw a rock uh, in the global community without finding movement of stuff right we live in a very globalized society imports and exports um, everything is bought and sold and packaged and shipped around the world imported and exported um, and it could be natural resources like cotton or coal or wheat uh, or oil it could be food resources, right? A lot of our food that we get in Minnesota, although some of it's grown locally, in the winter months, we can't locally grow a lot of our food. So we're bringing it in from other parts of the US or from Mexico or other countries around the world. Uh, but then the United States, we also export things, right? We sell oil to the world. We sell soybeans to the world. In fact, many of the soybeans grown right here in Minnesota or the hogs raised right here in the upper Midwest are going to be then exported to other countries around the world. So that's all talking about movement of stuff. Oil, copper, water, clothing, food, cars, stuff. And then, like I said, it's also how it's transported. Is it transported on ship? Is it transported on plane? Is it train? How is it getting around to and from? And then lastly, our last type of movement is movement of ideas. 
I think this one is super rad because when we talk about movement of ideas, we are also talking about you know culture and how that spreads around the world and information, how that spreads around the world. Gang, you and I, we live in such an interconnected world. The internet allows us to spread info to and from and culture all around the world. Think about it for a second. Think back a few years. There was a gentleman from South Korea. Uh, he goes by the name of Psy, P-S-Y, and he had and still has that smash hit banger, Gangnam Style. Now think about that for a second. I'm not going to do the impersonation. You look it up. Maybe I'll link to it. Whoa. Gungam style. Okay, I did it. I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is terrible. Uh, but think about Sai for a second, right? That is a South Korean pop sensation that spread around the globe. 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, does Sai and Gangnam style, is that a cultural phenomenon in the United States? I don't know. Probably not. But that's this idea of culture spreading around the world. K-pop in general, it is huge outside of Korea. Anime, that is another Southeast Asian kind of... Um, uh, culture artistic thing that is spreading around the world. But we also have news that spreads around the world. We have literature, movies, magazines, TV, style of dress and fashion. All of these are cultural elements that spread around the world. Baseball, this great American pastime. Go Twins, this great American pastime. Going to win the World Series, this great American pastime is now big in, for example, South Korea and Japan, right? But again, this idea of culture and ideas and information spreading around the world. So we can talk about the actual spread of ideas. Another one would be religion, right? You think about kind of the main religion in the United States, Christianity. It did not originate here. It began in the Middle East. Right? But it's spread around the world. So again, this idea of culture spreading to and from and around a world. But we can also talk about um, how our culture is spread around the world. Let me hide that for you. Right? So we're talking about movie, uh, TV, music. Uh, news, uh, that's all s ideas that spread, but also how are ideas spread? Well, the biggie is the internet, right? That's how ideas are spread around the world today. Uh, but also TV, uh, social media, which is a part of the internet, absolutely, that spreads culture. But you've also got more traditional sources that spread culture, like the actual physical newspaper, books, right? This book right here, uh, Factfulness by a super awesome Swedish dude, Hans Rosling. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things um, that get spread around the world. So that's movement, people, stuff, and ideas. Well, how could we visualize that? Well, uh, fancy you should ask, right? It's spread through the internet. It's also the internet itself is culture, uh, music, ideas, just any way that you want to symbolize the movement of people, stuff, and ideas, that'll do. So there's movement. On to our next one, human environment interaction. That one refers to humans, that is you and I, the environment, that is our natural world, and then how we interact with one another. So how we as humans interact with our environment, and then of course, how the inner environment interacts with us. So what is the relationship between people and the environment? Again, just like uh, some of our other themes, like movement, there are these sub-themes. Human environment interaction, HEI as I like to call it, uh, also has some sub-themes. So our first sub-theme is adapt. How do people adapt to their environment? How do they adjust to their environment? Hey gang, we live in Minnesota. It's going to be cold soon. How are we going to adapt to that? How have we, as a culture in the upper Midwest, adapted to that? Well, we've adapted by, um, we've got an entire fleet of snow plows. We have a ton of salt and sand that we bring in. We have homes that have heat. We have parkas and clothing. Those have all allowed us to adapt to our environment. We go ice fishing. We go snowmobiling. We go skiing. Our pastimes, we have adapted our pastimes and our leisure times to our environment. We have adjusted to it. Right? In the summer, we rock those short shorts, jort life. Um, we have long pants and sweatshirts in the winter, the types of shelter that we have. Our clothing, our shelter here in Minnesota, do you think folks living in the Sahara Desert have big parkas and snowmobiles and homes with heats? Singular heat? Yeah, I don't think so. Right? Because we have adapted to our environment. Where you live greatly impacts how you live. And that's going to be a key theme of global studies. Where you live impacting 
how you live, but we'll, we'll dwell on that on another time. Humans, we also modify our environment. Sometimes our environment modifies us. Hold on to that thought, right? Thinking of our most basic example of how we have modified our environment. Anytime we build something, like this building I am in right now, at one point there were probably trees where this building stands. We came in, we plowed them down, we built a building, planted some grass, and now we've got middle school west. We have changed our environment. Farming, that changes your environment, that modifies your environment. Damming a river, that modifies and changes your environment. Pollution, holy cats, folks. Pollution, CO2 emissions, that modifies and changes our environment. And when we talk about environment, we're talking about that natural environment. Uh, we're talking about in the immediate, like if I cut down a tree, that's modifying my environment. But we're also talking long term. If I dam a river, that's modifying my environment or impacts on the climate, right? Human impacts on our climate. Um, so those are all modifying our environment in terms of how we change our environment, right? As a human species, you know, all 7 billion of us living on this planet, we are constantly modifying and changing our environment. Hunting, fishing, pollution, dams on rivers, all of that modifies our environment. And sometimes our environment it does modify us. It modifies how we live. If you live in an area prone to flooding, um, that's the environment basically coming at you and changing how you live your life, right? So you will have to adapt to that. And you'll notice there's a bit of overlap here, right? Maybe, you know, you live in an area uh, that is prone to flooding. And so you, um, the environment is modifying your way of life. So therefore you need to adapt. Some of these things don't fit in neat little boxes, right? There's a lot of overlap there. Fishing, maybe, um, you know, you've overfished an area and now the fish are gone. You have changed that environment. Um, but now the environment is also changing back because you have overfished that area. The point being, humans and environment, it's not a one-way street. It's not we do to the environment, Mother Nature does back to us. It's a big old uh, gnarly back and forth. Adapt, modify, and then lastly, depend. What do we need from our environment? Now, obviously, there's the basics like clean oxygen. Uh, there are the basics like clean water. Those things, yeah, absolutely. We need our environment for that. But think about STMA. We're a farming community um, in certain parts. And so there are folks who depend on farming, for example, corn farming or soybean farming. They depend on that for their livelihood. That's their main economic activity. Let's kick it back up to the North Shore, the Iron Range of Minnesota. Iron ore mining, taconite mining, that's a economic need, an economic dependency that folks have. They're saying, hey, we depend on that for our environment. Now think about this for a second. Not only does mining, for example, that might be an economic activity where folks depend on that and they need that, but that's also modifying their environment, right? And so sometimes we need to balance our needs, our dependency uh, with our modifications and how we change our environment. There are some folks who would say, you know what, we get that, you know, maybe this economy Economy is based on mining, um, but let's take a step back and maybe not look at the economic impact, but how are we also changing our environment and should we continue with this economic activity? These are all things that are greatly interconnected when it comes to human environment interaction. Um, so again, yes, we depend on our environment for food and water, but we also look at how we depend on our environment for needs like economic activity. Um, so there we go, human environment interaction. We adapt to our environment, we modify our environment, we depend on our environment. That is, we adjust, we change, and we need. Um, so how do I like to sketch that out? There's a lot of things you could put on there, but here is my human. Here is my environment. Notice them interacting with one another. Um, it's as simple as that. Uh, so. There we go. Now, wrapping it up and recapping it, you're going, well, how? I have got this wonderful framework, the five themes of geography. I can use it to apply uh, and learn about the world anywhere. Um, but how am I going to remember it? Well, it's your good friend, Mr. Help. Mr. Help, movement. Right? People, stuff, and ideas move to and from and around the world. 
region. It's how we can compartmentalize our world. It's how we find out uh, defining characteristics that certain areas have in common with one another. Human environment interaction. There's our HE, human environment interaction, talking about how humans in the environment interact with one another. And we've got location. We've got our absolute location and our relative location. And then lastly, place, talking about the natural physical, or uh, yes, the natural physical characteristics of a place and the human personal characteristics of a place. That's it. Um, those are your five themes of geography. That's going to wrap up this video lecture. Now, of course, there are um, a couple of videos at the end on the actual slides. Um, I would encourage you to check them out, but I'm not going to put them as a part of this recorded video lecture. And then we've also got this little song here. It's an absolute shredder. It's a banger. It rips. I'm going to play it as we um, just kind of scroll on and head on out of here. Hope you're doing well. Let me know if you have any questions questions. Adios. Maybe I'm not going to play it because it's loading and it's buffering. Hmm, that's awkward. Well, at any rate, I will fix that. Uh, adios, friends. See ya.